Christ is risen. Praise be to God. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning at Covenant Church, those here physically and those who are worshiping online. Um, today's, again, is a special Sunday. It's Easter Sunday as we uh, celebrate the resurrection of Christ and with us because he rose, we also rise. And also we will celebrate communion today because we shared in his death, so we share in his resurrection as well. Those are all the announcements I have. Let's start our praise worship. The Jews rise with us in body or in spirit as we sing Christ the Lord is risen today. morning. A happy and a blessed Easter to you all. For Christians, this is Super Bowl Sunday for us. It's the day where God raised Jesus from the dead, the biggest day of the Christian year. And it's a day of victory, a day where God has confirmed all that Jesus said and did and raised him victoriously from the grave. We also know that maybe there's some family and friends here that uh, think this whole uh, thing of Easter is a bunch of nonsense. How can we believe in this person that can be raised from the dead? 
In a post-Christian world, we don't often believe things like that too easily. But just want to encourage you, if that's where you are at this point, we're going to wrestle with that in our sermon. It's titled, Easter Begins in Nonsense, but Moves on to Remembering and Believing. Our God calls us to worship. We thought you were dead. We thought the cross was the end. We thought that when the stone rolled over the tomb, that was it. But this is it. The dead are living. The cross is empty. The stone is rolled away. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. We thought you had said your final word. We thought that when they crucified you, death had defeated life. We thought that when you cried out, that was it. But this is it. The word breathes. The powers are defeated. The final cry was only the beginning. Alleluia. Christ is risen. We thought the story was finished. We thought the hope had ended. We thought that when the tomb was sealed, that was it. But this is it. The story has just begun. Hope is newly born. The tomb is empty. This is the good news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This time we'll dismiss the children for Sunday school. So if you're guests with us, you have children ages 3 to 11. You're welcome to send them out with our children. And the children, just remember, we're going to have you all back for the, the communion after the sermon. So be blessed as you go off to Sunday school.
Let's go to our God in a time of prayer. O oh, holy God, we come before you this Easter day overflowing with mixed emotions, if we're honest. In some ways, we are overflowing with gratitude for all you've done with the spring rains and bright sunshine. We are reminded of resurrection life and renewal. But we can't forget that your world remains in so many corners a dark and stormy place, sunk deep into the cold winter of sin and evil. Those who first witnessed your son's resurrection found it to be a fearful and wonderful event. For you, O oh great God of surprises, crashed into our reality with something new and unexpected. But on this morning, we do not want to forget the darkness of Friday afternoon and the way by which the Easter victory came about. We cannot forget the sacrifice, the bloody death, the God-forsaken pain of it all. The clash between your kingdom and this world was fierce. But today we do praise you for all the might and the power and the creativity by which you've won the victory. Father, we praise you for raising from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, the shepherd of all who take up their cross and follow him. but because we cannot and must not forget also the darkness of sin that even still is around us, we make petition this morning for all people anywhere and everywhere who continue to feel crucified by a cruel world and do not perceive any Easter. We pray for refugees, for tortured prisoners, for the innocent victims of war. We pray for abused children and battered women. We pray for the homeless poor and those victimized and diminished by racism, discrimination, and, and oppression of all kinds. We pray for all those who can see no Easter light because all that is good and lovely has been eclipsed by a depression that will not lift or by chronic pain that will not decrease. O oh Lord, the things that led Jesus to the cross have not yet disappeared from the face of the earth. The need for resurrection remains stubborn, stubbornly present in the lives of millions. So make us, O oh Spirit of the living God, life-giving spirits to minister to those in need this Easter Sunday and always. We lift up Bill and Tanya DeWarder as Bill deals with the ongoing pain and suffering of that horrible disease of cancer. We lift up Willie Zomer as she waits for a Woodingford home or an eternal one. I think you know which one she would prefer, O oh Lord. So be merciful to this sister and so many others who long to see you face to face. Father God, we celebrate along with Ricky and David and their families for the birth of precious little Sophie Jean. May she know your love through the love of her parents and her grandparents and so many others as they teach her to know and love you. Lord God, be especially near to those in this church family who feel that they need to believe in the resurrection more than ever, but they're finding it more and more difficult because they feel overwhelmed with life and its demands. And be with each of us gathered for this service. Thank you for friends and family who are guests this morning. 
Grant them a special blessing by your spirit. We bless you, Father God, for gracing us with liturgy planners and musicians who spend their talents thoughtfully and well in this place so that all of us may be edified and through the mystery of music and liturgy be drawn closer to you. But above all, we thank you for the presence of the Spirit of the living Lord, Christ Jesus. As we encounter nothing short of your very self this morning, may we know for sure that we have indeed been in your sacred presence. And may this encounter in turn embolden us to live an Easter life, not only now but also in the days to come and forevermore. Help us to take what we learn and experience here and allow it to set a holy tone for us always and everywhere. And Lord, as we open up your most holy and precious word, we ask that you would send your spirit to give us deeper insight, encouragement, faith, and hope through the proclamation of the Easter gospel. And all God's people say, Amen. Our reading this morning is from Luke 24, verses 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, some of you may have seen the recent movie, Don't Look Up, starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Randall and Jennifer Lawrence as Kate. In the film, these two movie stars are astronomers who discover that a huge asteroid is on a collision course with planet Earth. But when astronomers Randall and Kate attempt to share the bad news with everyone, they are met with suspicion, unbelief, and in many cases, ridicule. That's nonsense, was many a remark. Now this nonsensical response to this news was sheer nonsense to the female character Kate who tried her best through a passionate plea to make people understand the seriousness of this really bad news. With some colorful language, she alerted everyone who was listening that if this asteroid struck, the whole world is going to die. 
And the response to female astronomer Kate, ah, she's just too hysterical, too emotional and crazy. Watching how people responded to Kate was maddening, to say the least. And I can assure you that some other women in our Bible text knew exactly how Kate was feeling. You see, these group of women who were with Jesus from the very beginning were honored to be the first people not to share the bad news events. An event that would bring death to all people, but an event that would bring life to all people. Life to all things, for that matter. Resurrection, life. These women were even visited by angels who were the first to hear of God's table in the wilderness. A table filled with the first fruits of a new creation. The first fruit being the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. He is risen. But when these women tried to tell the apostles the good news, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. People of God, believe it or not, Easter begins in nonsense. And it starts right there in verse 1, the very first Easter Sunday morning. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now you might be thinking, what's so nonsensical about that, Pastor John? After all, these are the women who stuck by Jesus at the cross when all the men ran and hid. And because these God-fearing women were there with Jesus till the end, they saw where Joseph of Arimathea had laid the body of Jesus. We see this in Luke 23. But these same women, as I mentioned already, were also with Jesus from the very beginning. And that's where the nonsense starts to make some sense, if you follow me. These women are die-hard followers of Jesus. They saw Jesus heal the lame. They saw him cast out demons. They ate the bread and the fish that Jesus had multiplied miraculously. They were there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But we remember Lazarus died again. And they were there to hear Jesus say this in Luke 9, 22. The Son of Man must suffer and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus has said this on multiple occasions, by the way. These women, along with all of Jesus' other disciples, should have known by now that if Jesus says something's going to happen, you can bank on it. So these burial spices are a nice gesture and all, but burial spices are for dead people, not for someone who's alive. Easter begins in nonsense. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. Well, surprise, surprise. What Jesus said would happen, happened. But this event, event wasn't meant to be a surprise party. Of course the tomb is empty. Of course, Jesus isn't here. Tombs are for dead people. And Jesus is alive. Now check this out. 
The Bible doesn't mention it, but I have a sneaking suspicion that there were thousands, if not millions, of angels right there watching this amazing event unfold. Can't you just see them looking at each other, shaking their heads, maybe rolling their eyes at the women as the women hang their heads, wondering what in the world is going on? Look up, the angels might say. And finally, two angels do get the long-awaited nod of approval to end this Easter nonsense for the women. Verses 4 to 7. While the women were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living? Among the dead. That's nonsense. He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, raised again. Brothers and sisters, before we throw shade on these women for their forgetfulness, let's remember our own human nature. We all tend to forget the things that we regard as nonsense, don't we? We all tend to forget the things we regard as nonsense. But the good news is that an antidote, there is an antidote for this nonsense. And the antidote for this Easter nonsense is remembrance. Then they remembered his words. They remembered the words of the word made flesh. Oh, yeah. Jesus did say that, didn't he? At the time, we thought he was speaking nonsense. But now, it makes perfect sense. Jesus is alive. He is risen indeed. Let's go tell the 11 apostles and all the others. So off the women went, the very first witnesses to the greatest discovery ever made, an empty tomb. An empty tomb that meant that Jesus was alive. In verse 10, Luke finally gives us some of the women's names that were there. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the disciples or the apostles. Now, before we hear the apostles and the other disciples' response, let's keep this in mind. These women that Luke has mentioned are highly respected disciples. Some of them are the mothers of the 11 remaining apostles, not to mention Mary, the mother of Jesus. Some of these women have been and continue to support this group of now 120 disciples financially. So when in verse 11 we read, but that they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense, I think there's more than male chauvinism going on here. Because along with these 11 male disciples are also a whole bunch of female disciples in that group. Other women who also thought that the words of the Marys and Joanna were nonsense. The main point of the story, everyone, is this. At first, everyone thought that this early Easter news was nonsense. Remember good old Thomas? Later on, ten of the apostles tell him that they have seen Jesus, but he won't believe it. He thinks it's nonsense. 
Now we know from verse 12 that at least Peter ran down to the tomb to check it out for himself. And we know from the Gospel of John that John also went with Peter. This is John's account in John chapter 20. So Peter and the other disciple, he always called himself the other disciple, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the, town, reached the tomb first. He bent over and, and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who, who was behind, arrived and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Now that little detail is quite important, everyone. Because if Jesus' body was actually stolen, as some later suggested, grave robbers don't usually do a little laundry during a break-in, do they? Now that's nonsense. For the Apostle John, we see in verse 8 of John chapter 20 how it all started to make sense for him. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside. <clears throat> he saw and believed. John saw and he believed. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, Easter begins in nonsense. It's not the most romantic beginning to such an important event that helps define and shape Christianity, but it's the truth. Now for some like these women who remember the words of Jesus and who, who saw the empty tomb, <clears throat> excuse me, that was enough for them to believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead just as he said would happen. But for many of the, of the disciples, it would take much more for them to believe. Listen to verses 36 to 44 of this chapter where Jesus appears to the disciples in his resurrected body. While they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your mind? I love that play of words by Jesus. He has just risen from the dead, and the only thing that's rising in the disciples' minds are doubts. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and blow bones as you see I have. When Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Last I checked, ghosts don't eat food either. Jesus has demonstrated his point. And then Jesus did some reminding of his own in verse 44. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you. This is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and the Psalms. Everything. Jesus had done that. Jesus had fulfilled the offices of prophet, priest, and king perfectly. Everything was fulfilled. Salvation was accomplished, and the new creation had just begun. 
about poor Thomas. The apostle who wasn't there when Jesus first appeared. Well, listen to John 20, starting at verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord! We've seen him! But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. Easter begins in nonsense. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was there with them this time. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting. Believe. Stop doubting. Believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. My risen Lord and my God. People of God, Jesus is alive. But maybe you came here this Easter morning and you have been living your life like the resurrection is a bunch of nonsense. Your life is not characterized by the, the dying of the old nature and the coming to life of the new, which is an ongoing, slow process. Maybe you're spending all your time putting spices on your dying life to cover up the smell. And not remembering or even knowing the words of Jesus. Jesus who said this in John eleven, twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's the question Jesus has for every one of us this Easter morning. Do you believe this? Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. And for those of us who can identify with doubting skeptical Thomas, Jesus' original words to him are for you and for me. Then Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. Are you in that blessed group? If not, put an end to the nonsense right now. Remember and believe. Always remember what God has done for you through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of God's people say, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have opened the minds of many who are here this morning. For that, we give you thanks. But if there are any still sitting here now who are still having a, a hard time believing, 
We pray in the mighty name of Jesus that their minds will be opened, their hearts will be opened this very moment. And what they once viewed as nonsense will now make perfect sense. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit for our song of response, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. someone go get the Sunday school um, teachers and kids to come back in? I'll invite the serving elders forward. waiting for the children to come back in. Just some logistics and a welcome to all of our guests that are with us. 
We certainly invite all those who love Jesus, or your, you or your children who love Jesus and ser want to serve him and do serve him, you're welcome to come to this table with joy and gladness. Also, just so you know, all of our bread is gluten-free as well. They must be enjoying themselves back there. It's hard, hard getting them here. Here they come. <laughs> I see the kids. Where are the teachers? <laughs> Celebrate communion together as a family. Oftentimes we'll have communion before the sermon so that we can avoid this part of it. But that was my bad. I didn't realize the children had Sunday school today till later. So we're grateful our kids could be here with us to celebrate communion. Even children carrying other children. <laughs> Elaine, all the teachers back? That you know of? Okay. All right. The invitation. The pattern of faith and true life is clear enough. God gives and we receive. God gives far more abundantly than we ask or imagine we receive. God gives life and breath to the world, gives miracles and deliverance and newness, and we receive. God gives God's very self in Jesus and we receive. People of God, this is the table where God intends for us to be well fed. This is the table where the abundance of the whole creation and the angels surround us. This is the way Christ comes to renew his people. So come, all you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, a richer life, and a fairer world. Christ has come. Christ will come again and again to feed us in the wilderness of life. Let's come to him in prayer. Come, Lord, be our host at this table. Bread and juice are waiting. On your words depend all our celebrating. We praise you that as we break bread in faith, we shall know the risen Christ among us. Send your Holy Spirit on us and these gifts, that they may become for us vibrant with your life, and that in them we may know Christ's presence, the Father's provision, and the Spirit's comfort, real and true. All God's people say, Amen. Among friends, those who were bewildered, that is, in the wilderness, and gathered around a table, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Then Christ broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Through that act, Christ teaches that this loaf this table symbolizes a new relationship with God and with each other, sealed with Christ's body given for you.
take and eat, remember and believe that God through Jesus Christ does provide a table in the presence of all of our enemies. In the same way, Jesus took wine and blessed it. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Then he poured the wine and gave it to his disciples. This cup then and now symbolizes a new relationship with God and with each other. It is sealed with Christ's blood, which is poured out and given for you.
take, drink, remember, and believe that God, through our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, spreads a table in the middle of all of our fears. Right now. <clears throat> Having shared this bread and this juice, we can expect to be a little more keenly able to notice the table of God's provision through all the hours and the days of our lives. It is the table of life itself. We can expect to recognize Jesus Christ in all our meals and in our fellowship. And we remember that our lives, like his, are for the sake of the salvation of a suffering world. Lord Jesus Christ, in deep gratitude for this moment and for the provision of this table, we give ourselves to you. We confess we often labor for what does not satisfy. We try to drink from broken cisterns and it doesn't work. But having delighted now in your abundance, send us out to live changed lives. For having shared in the living bread, we cannot remain the same. You have asked much of us this Lenten journey, and you have enabled much by us, and you have encouraged many through us. For we journey with you, Lord Christ, spirit led into the wilderness of all of our fears, there to find courage, the courage that strengthens us to lean once more into the winds, the gusts of grace that have sustained your people throughout all the wildernesses of life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say, amen. We respond to God's word and God's table with gratitude. One way we do that is by how we give, not only of our finances, but of our everything. Your offerings will now be received. Resonate Global Missions and our church budget.
Oh, Lord and God, you know how much skepticism and doubt and cynicism is in this world. We are those people. As human beings, we, we share in that. Or we have a hard time believing things that seem like nonsense to us. But Lord, we're so thankful for the ability to worship, where your spirit gives us eyes to see. And we're thankful for Resonate Global Mission, whose mission it is to preach that nonsensical Easter news to so many. And we ask that your spirit would go forth and make perfect sense out of this beautiful nonsense. We pray it in your precious name. Amen. Hello. Hello. I was just checking the mic was on. Um, tomorrow, Pastor John starts a sabbatical, and I will lead us together in prayer as we pray for Pastor John, his family, and for Covenant Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless Pastor John during his sabbatical. Renew him for ministry through this time set aside for reflection and study, the refreshment of a break from daily tasks and routine, and the excitement of new learning and direction. Grace him with your presence and keep him steadfast in the faith. God of love, whose will it is that humans live in community, bless the Molker family during this sabbatical time. Fill their home with joy, laughter, and prayer so that this might be a time of renewal for each of them individually and together as a family. Eternal God, bless your church. You fill us with every good thing, and your steadfast love endures forever. We thank you for Pastor John, his family, and for our life together at Covenant Church. As they depart for sabbatical, send them forth with your blessing. Fill them with your spirit and bring them again into our presence with renewed life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and in your holy words you assure us, telling us, I will always be with you. And when we acknowledge all the things you are doing in our midst, and as you reveal to us who you are, we bring praise and thanks to you. We praise you, O Lord, for readily filling our pulpit each Sunday during the sabbatical with pastors and exhorters. For a church family filled with expressions of love and care, be with your church as we continue to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, as we strive to be faithful to you. Amen. Thanks, Diane. I also want to extend my thanks to out, uh, overflowing encouragement that I've received over the last number of weeks, uh, prayers and cards and face-to-face -face encouragement. Um, yeah, I'm going to miss, miss this church family, but I will, as Diane prayed for, we're excited to see what God will do with this sacred time for, for me and my family and also this church family. I look forward to coming back, re recharge and refresh, which is the goal. We'll see what God does with it. Please stand in body or in spirit for this Easter benediction. <clears throat> Go out into the world in the joy and the peace of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Care for the redeemed creation. Follow him as children of your light. Make disciples by your life and words and glorify him by your dedication and love. So may he bless you with his gift of the Holy Spirit and be with you until his kingdom comes. Hallelujah. And all God's people say, Amen. <clears throat>